The views and opinions expressed did not necessarily reflect those of Access Fort Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. Hi, uh, welcome to For Destiny, a program putting a face on child abuse and lingering impact of child abuse. Just an article and I saw on Yahoo yesterday that said the number one cause of depression in adults is child abuse. No surprise there. Uh, also, the United States has one of the highest rates of child abuse in the developed world, uh, which is a shameful statistic. And today we'll have uh, beautiful music from Filthy Rags. Thank you very much. And uh, then we will have a lecture from Jenna from uh, the uh, Board of Health on uh, the difficulties in reporting child abuse that medical professionals have obstacles they encounter. And then a panel discussion beginning with a short video news clip of Randy Shepard talking about her law, Destiny's Law, to create tougher laws for child abusers in her home state of Ohio. And her child, Destiny, now 10, was shaken badly as an infant left for dead. She now is the face of uh, our program, Destiny Shepherd, and Destiny still suffers from seizures, and her shadow, the shadow of abuse, will follow her, unfortunately, all of her life, but she's a fighter, her mom's a fighter, seven years of fighting for Destiny's Law, and she hopes it will pass this year. We will have Dennis Cruz here, Senator Cruz, who is working on a, a similar law, and we'll find out the status of that, and then our panel with uh, Dr. Deborah McMahon from the Board of Health, Linda Hartley, a mental health therapist, and Lisa Smith from Mental Health America of Allen County. I'm Terry Doran. Uh, we want to thank our sponsor, IPFW and the uh, Behavioral Institute and Family Institute, Alice Miles Jordan. Uh, is the one who worked with us, who made this possible, getting Neff Hall. And certainly Tim Zent, my friend, who uh, filled in at the last minute to take care of all the technical problems. So thank you so much, Tim. Thank you for coming, and now Filthy Rags. And I should say, Track is on Facebook, and our official name is Three Rivers Art Center for Kids. We say using the power of art to combat child abuse. Uh, we're working on programs to uh, combat child homelessness in Fort Wayne. We did a forum, Homeless in the City of Churches, and we're bringing Lloyd Pendleton, an architect, not architect, but the creator of Housing First in Utah. He called in to our show, actually, a second homeless show. So look forward to that. Lloyd will be here in Fort Wayne to help us. Uh, create homeless shelter, shelter for homeless people here in Fort Wayne. All right, thank you. Filthy Rags. Hi, everybody. We are Filthy Rags. Glad you guys are here. Um, I'm Melissa Becker. This is Harry Becker, my husband. And this is Josh Spencer back here on the drums. And this is the never duplicated Mr. Tim Colby <laughs> on the bass. We're just going to play some of our original music for you. I hope you enjoy it, okay? This first song.
cup of tea but that's okay um the songs come just tw 20 seconds the songs come you know out of our hearts we've all been you know this is a great thing i wasn't necessarily a um my grandparents raised me okay um i my parents were abusers and um so i'm grateful that there was somebody in my life that took me in and taught me just how to be myself, but the thing that he said about depression, that's really true. Um, you know, still, even after having some love in there, when you're abused as a child, you do end up, and I did, with some really serious depression issues, and, um, um, you know, just, this is my outlet, you know, this is, this is what I do, and it's great that this exists, kids and art, you know, this is art, it is, this is creative art, um, however they want to express themselves, if it helps heal something on the inside, I'm all for it. So this is the last song, uh, it was our sound check song, it's called Longs For You. Mm -hmm. I am searching, I'm calling out, I am trying search me
This is strange Suddenly things like a flame in autumn Still burning in the spring It gives me strength It gives me hope It gives me passion In this house we call But I need some rainbows and Peaches and cream And I need some rain Wash me clean And I need some love But doesn't everybody Doesn't everybody Doesn't everybody Doesn't everybody Doesn't everybody Scream at children As they play They fight the battles To find their way You gotta get Gotta give them faith, gotta give them kindness You got to keep them safe, but they need a blanket To keep them warm, and they need some shelter To hide from the storms, and they need understanding From the day they are born, but doesn't everybody Doesn't everybody Doesn't everybody, doesn't everybody You dance to the rhythm of my soul You took the chance and you will know That I still like making angels in the snow But doesn't everybody, doesn't everybody Doesn't everybody Doesn't everybody And I need some rainbows And peaches and cream And I need some rain To wash me clean And I need some love But doesn't it Doesn't everybody Doesn't everybody Doesn't everybody Doesn't everybody Access board, so thank them for sure. And now, uh, Jenna Sanders from the uh, Board of Health, Director of Informatics. Informatics. You can tell us what that is. Uh, and as I said earlier, she's going to talk about the obstacles mental health uh, medical professionals, especially, face when trying to report child abuse. As you said, my name is Jana Sanders. I'm the Director of Informatics for the Fort Wayne Allen County Department of Health. Informatics is a study of data and information. So along with doing the general IT for the department, I also do the study of the data. And uh, part of my role is doing a lot of uh, research studies also. So this is one of the research studies that we were able to conduct. Part of our research team, this was a collaboration between the Department of Health and the Fort Wayne Medical Education Program. So Dr. Mike Wilson, who's the Director of Research at the Fort Wayne Medical Education Program, Dr. McMahon was also part of the study, as well was two residents within the residency, Dr. Grinnell and Dr. Tanner. They have both since graduated the program. The study was originally done in 2013. Literature frequently refers to abuse and neglect as child maltreatment. Child maltreatment is found across all different social economic scales and um, races. The definition of child maltreatment varies from state to state. However, federally, it is defined as 
any act or failure to that results in imminent risk or serious harm to a child. In Indiana, there's four main character classifications of child abuse and neglect. Um, the first one is neglect. It is the most frequently reported type of maltreatment. It's failure to take care of or give attention to, to provide the necessities to the point where the child's health and safety and well-being are threatened. And it's the most lethal form of abuse or neglect in, uh, child maltreatment. Examples are failure to provide shelter, food, safety, supervision, nutritional needs, um, and also can include physical, educational, emotional neglect. There's also physical abuse, which is the presence of an injury that the child sustains at the hands of a care provider. This is a non-accidental physical injury, and it's exhibited by bruises and broken bones. The third classification is sexual abuse. It's the utilization of a child for sexual gratification, either by an adult, another child, or a position in power. And it's also um, can be allowing someone else to do that. The fourth classification is emotional neglect. It's the chronic attitude or act of a caregiver that is detrimental to the child's development. Most often, most often it's expressed as a verbal abuse. And it's usually indicated and observed through a substantial change in behavior or an emotional response or thought. In the United States, more than five children die every year as a result of maltreatment. Of those that die, about 80% of them are under the age of three years old. This is an alarming fact. This statistic, along with their recent attention to cases in the media where multiple people were thought to have known about the abuse before it um, was come to light, brings, question, brings into question how many times do mandated reporters know about the abuse and neglect. This sparked an idea for a pilot study to be conducted in 2012 a study was conducted with a research fellowship program here in town in which we did a small sample and a brief survey of about nine questions. What we found in the literature review was that victims tend to be between ages eight, zero and 17 years old. Uh, all these rates that I will describe right here is per thousand uh, population. And the national, the important thing to know about these stats is national data is unique victims. So this isn't um, cases that reported more than once or children that were abused more than once. That differs from the Indiana and Allen County statistics because that doesn't indicate if it's a repeated abuse of cases or not. So if you look, in 2009, the national average was 9.4, Indiana was 15.6, and Allen County was 11.5. So Indiana had a higher rate, while Allen County um, was lower than Indiana, but still higher than the national. In 2011, you see there's a drastic difference in Allen County in which there was a reduction of 3.9, in which 7.6 cases per thousand people. In the end of this, there was also a drop where the national was a little bit more consistent. Since 1994, cases have dropped substantially um, when in 1994 the cases were about 15 per thousand. So it leads to the question, what changed over time? Um, why such the drop in the number of cases? Is it better, um, is, it, is it less abuse? Is it better um, reporting or is it a lack of reporting? Indiana Code, Title 31, Article 33, Chapter 5, establishes the rules for who is required to report. Um, looking closely at this, uh, any individual who believes a child has been a victim of abuse or neglect is required by Indiana Code to report. Um, and this is, the key point to keep in mind here is that it's anyone that suspects child abuse or neglect is required to report. You don't have to be able to prove it, you just have to suspect it. And the intent of this code is that you're doing it in the best interest of the child and it's not malicious. Looking closer into section two of the code, having um, there are certain professions that have a responsibility to report suspected cases of child abuse and neglect. These are refer referred to as mandated reporters as a result of their profession. Specifically, medical, public or private institutions, School facility or agency shall notify a supervisor who is then required to file a report with the Department of Children's Services. One thing to keep in mind in this is this is not just the medical professionals or the teachers specifically, but it's any personnel within those agencies. Our review of the literature also gave us insight as to um, different risk factors for children that are abused. 
these children are at higher risk for being abused. As we mentioned, age is a big factor, with 80% of the victims being less than three years of age. Of these 80%, 67% are less than one, one year old. <coughs> a past history of abuse also um, makes someone more at risk for being abused again. Repeated abuse has been shown to occur in one fifty percent of the cases. Abuse tends to happen more frequently in um, children with learning disabilities and speech and language disorders, um, mental dis um, retardation in children with congenital abnorm abnormalities, and chronic reoccurring conditions. And also, uh, adopted and foster children are at higher risk of being abused even after once in the system. So what do the perpetrators look like? Parents are typically the perpetrators of more than 75% of the time. 61% of the perpetrators are women. So more than half of the perpetrators are the women that are doing the abuse. Poverty plays an important role. Families that have an annual income less than $15,000 a year are 22 times more likely to abuse or neglect a child than families that make $30,000 or more a year. Other risk factors include young or single parents, victims of abuse themselves, people who did not graduate from high school, mental illness, um, being present in the adult, substance abuses, 40% um, of confirmed cases are related to substance abuse, and then domestic violence, children abuse, children, child abuse is 15 times more likely to occur in families where intimate partner abuse occurs. Also, non-biological transient caregivers in the home which is typically partners, also tend to hire, have a higher risk of being perpetrators. The consequences of child abuse include physical consequences such as shaken baby syndrome, impaired brain development, and poor physical health. Psychological consequences, which include poor decision making, symptoms of mental illness, eating disorders, and suicide attempts are also present. Ch child abuse also impacts social behaviors. Abused children have a 60% likelihood of interacting with the juvenile justice system, drug use, arrest for violent crimes, prostitution in adult life, or pregnancy. Finally, academic performance is also impacted. Abused children tend to have poor school performance and classroom functioning. A 2012 study by V found that many mandated reporters were not reporting it every suspected case of abuse or neglect. She found that 65% of social workers would have a suspected case and not report it, 53% of physicians, and 58% of physicians' assistants did not report suspect all suspected cases. The reasons vary, um, such as lack of training, signs, and sufficient of evidence. Further review of the literature also found that with formal education of abuse, Providers were more than, were ten times more likely to report maltreatment. So if an if a person had been educated on abuse, they were more likely to report it. A different study, Flattery and Siege, went a step further and determined an increased number of hours also increased the likelihood. They found that providers with more than ten hours of um, education were likely to increase the likelihood of reporting. The purpose of this study was to identify the barriers in Allen County um, that would prevent providers from reporting suspected cases of abuse. We're hoping to the study would provide valuable information, understanding, and insight into the complexity situation of child abuse neglect and help direct educational interventions so that the reporting could increase. So these are a few of our research questions. We wanted to know what the level of difficulty was found by medical professionals in reporting, what the level of comfort was in identifying, and what merit barriers they faced, and then what was their most reported, commonly reported course of action. Our methodology of our study, we had a questionnaire that we um, evaluated with both SCAN and the directors of, uh, the SCAN director and two nurses from the community nursing at Parkview as well as the research team. We had a 22 item survey. Um, 
we had a 22 item question survey that we sent out to medical professionals who uh, saw children at some point in their practice. We also went through institutional review boards at both Lutheran Hospital and Parkview Hospital. And the inclusion criteria was just anyone that could have internet access and answer the questions via the internet. But like I said, the research instrument was a 22 questionnaire. We did it through SurveyMonkey and we sent it out through email. The data collection had a designated person from each group in which they sent out an invitation email to the group and then we had a two week data collection period in which we collected results. Which now we'll talk about those results. We had 202 people respond to our survey. These are all medical professionals in some um, fashion. Of our respondents, over three fourths were female. Um, and the age range of the respondents varied from 20 years old to 94 years old, with the mean being 45 years old. 96% of our respondents were from Allen County. We surveyed various fields such as nurses, physicians, nurse practitioners, and also we did survey dentists and dental assistants. We also looked at various specialties such as family practice or um, nurses that are found in the public school systems and private school systems. One of our questions was, have you ever reported a suspected case? And at least two thirds of our study had reported a suspected case at one time in their career. Here's a breakdown of the different fields of our respondents. And as you see, the most common one was nurses at 49.2%. The specialty, when you break that down closer and look at what their, their area of, of um, expertise is, um, again, was the family practice was our largest respondents, and then followed by uh, nurses that are found in the school systems. But you see we had a wide variety from emergency to dentistry, and Pete. In an effort to determine how many years our respondents had been in practice, we asked how long it had been since the completion of their training. As you see, the majority of our respondents had been in, in, um, in work more than 10 years. We also wanted to ask how many formal hours of training they had for identifying abuser and neglected children. One third of the respondents said they had no formalized training on maltreatment, while half of the respondents said they had between one to five hours of training on identifying child abuse and neglect. Taking that and breaking it out further, that means only 7.6 of our respondents had that recommended 10 or more hours of training that would increase the likelihood of the reporting. We then asked if you suspected abuse of abuse, a case of abuse or neglect, would you, how would you re report it? We gave them um, five different options. Only 26% knew that the child abuse hotline was the proper methodology to call. And the, the more interesting fact here is at least almost 5% didn't know where to call at all. When we asked about their comfort level with regards to the, not their knowledge on Indiana laws, 51% said they were comfortable, 48% said they were not. That means 49% were not comfortable knowing the Indiana laws and therefore may not know their requirement with regards to having to report suspected cases. We also then asked, in terms of difficulty, how difficult do you find it identifying a case of child abuse, or a suspected case of a child abuse or neglect? And here's our breakdown, you see that 4.5% um, found identifying a child abuse or neglect either very easy or easy. That meant 40%, 46% found it either difficult or very difficult. We then assessed how, they, um, how comfortable they were reporting a case if they had identified one. Um, we, we grouped this together with the different um, CAD classifications. You see across the board, people were more than 80% comfortable in reporting a case once they had suspected it. We then asked what types of abuse and neglect people had seen in their practice within the, within the last year. And not surprisingly, neglect was the most commonly identified form of abuse or neglect. Emotional was second, and then physical was third. And sexual abuse was the least prominent. 
we wanted to try to assess the attitudes towards reporting, and so we asked a situational question with regards to how, how certain would you have to be that a case of child abuse or neglect occurred before you reported it? And this is their response. Um, the sidebar is in the number of people that responded. And then the bottom is how certain they were with 100% being completely certain it occurred and zero being no possibility it occurred. And so as you see, 70% of the respondents replied that they would need to be 50% or higher before they had reasonable suspicion that would prompt them to report. Um, that goes against the, the co current court ordinance of the law and the fact that if there's any suspension, once you're at that 10%, all of those people should be reporting. We also asked another situational question in which the practitioner would have um, assessed suspicion, suspicion that child abuse or neglect occurred, but there were other possible causes, what their course of action would be. We gave them four options. We gave them the option to treat the condition and inform the parents or not inform the parents or treat the other condition. So 33%, 33.5% said they would treat the other condition and not inform the parents. 27% said they would treat the condition and inform the parents. 23% said they would report it, not inform. And 15.9% said they would report and tell the care providers. Again, the, that's over 50% that would treat the condition. There's, this is an implied suspicion of abuse. Over 50% would treat the, other, treat the other condition and not report it, which again this is the classification that they should be reported. We wanted to break that down and look closely at the variables in those, that situation. So when I looked at the, the treating versus the reporting, 61% would treat it versus report it. When we looked at the tough conversational piece of informing the care provider of the suspicions of child abuse or neglect, we found that 43% would inform the care provider, which means over half of them would not inform the care provider. So that discussion of um, the potential uh, intervention is not occurring at this point. We also asked the providers if feedback from Child Protective Services was important to them clinically in making determination um, uh, or caring for their patient. And 96% said yes. We were very surprised at that. It was such a large number found a clinically important to know their outcome of their um, report with DCS. <clears throat> we then gave them seven potential barriers that might prohibit them from reporting a suspected case of abuse or neglect. These are all the different options that we gave. And this is just to show you the dramatic um, results of the outcomes. What we're going to do now is look at the top five, which is the top 30. 30% or more identified these. Now, every provider could identify every single one of those barriers if it applied to them. Um, so 69% said lack of certainty was their primary barrier in not reporting the case of child abuse or neglect. Fear of th making things worse for the child was found in almost 50%. The lack of follow-up or feedback from CPS was found in 35%. And uncertainty of the reporting procedures was identified in 32%. And then the big one was the fear of lack of anonymity from DCS or the parents, so potentially impacting their business. From the results of our study, we feel that medical professionals need formalized education on all issues related to child abuse and neglect, including signs and symptoms of how to report, as many healthcare providers are unaware of the correct procedures and the number to call to report a suspected case of abuse and neglect. Remember our study showed that 70% had to be at least 50% certain and had it ranked in the top five of a, differ of a differential diagnosis. Um, however, by law, they were all supposed to report the cases if suspected. So why don't providers share their concerns? We need to teach providers how to have the difficult discussions with the parents when the issues they've seen arise. They may be, they may be the only point of contact in which the, the child could be identified. Clinical decision making related to suspected child abuse and neglect could be improved with increased communication and feedback from Child Protective Services. Child Protective Services must address the multiple barriers that exist as identified by medical professionals for effective reporting. 
and suspected child abuse and neglect to occur. These include issues related to anonymity for reporters, the, the ability for them not to determine it was the physician that reported, report investiga investigation follow through, follow up with reporters regarding the investigations, and prioritizing reports made by medical professionals. 96% wanted the feedback, so working together to give that is important. Collaboration should also occur between child protective services and the medical community to develop a more efficient and effective process for reporting the feedback while maintaining the anonymous status of the reporter. Ways to collaborate in the local foundation organizations to support focus groups, university partners for education and awareness, and support of policymakers. Uh, recently, IU School of Medicine Child Protection Program, which is Dr. Roberta Hibbard, um, and the Indiana State Medical Association have been collaborating to work on creating online CME, which is continuing education credits, to provide providers more education on how to identify and um, report child abuse and neglect. Institutional policy should also be established and consistent with current state laws. Additionally, policy should be written in clear and understandable language and reviewed routinely with all professionals involved in the care of children. So each organization should have a clearly stated policy that is understandable for their staff to know what the procedure is if they suspect a case of abuse or neglect. Further education delivered by multiple methods should be developed and offered to medical community on various topics including roles and responsibilities, identification of child abuse and neglect, and correct reporting procedures. Remember, only 7.6% identified that they had received more than 10 hours of education. There should be a mandatory education beginning in the university level and then additional education at the professional level. Simulated experiences should also be developed. Intervention, intervention should also be developed that do not just address secondary and tertiary levels of prevention, but focus on the primary prevention. Parenting classes, reduction of family violence, emergency resources for respite, and also just collaboration within community partners. Our recommendations that resulted from the study is further research, research is needed. Uh, we had a relatively small sample size, so a larger sample size, including other groups such as teachers, daycare workers, child development workers, and first responders, all the people that come in contact with children in their daily interactions with their professions. Also, the examination of the risk factors that may predispose parents for family violence should be looked into more closely. And also a study the, of the relationship between the selected variables, the, the sex, the demographics, the level of training, and the level of difficulty or comfort for identifying and reporting the child abuse and neglect. The limitations we had within our studies that we had a moderate sample size. Our data collection time frame was only two weeks, which may have prohibited um, from getting a large uh, number of respondents. A limited geographic area, again, we focused primarily on Allen County and the um, groups associated with the hospital systems within this county. It's self-reported data. Self-reported data also always has limitations to it. And then the survey questions, um, there was 22 of them which could have been long, um, and there was probably assumptions made that was not interpreted the same way by the respondents. This is our references. And that concludes the presentation. Are there any questions? The question was how long did we work on this? And the pilot study, we were a part of the pilot study too, so that was a summer project with um, the research fellowship, the Mahi program with Indiana University at IKFW. So that was probably six months that we worked on that total. And then the actual, this study itself was probably a good nine months with the development, the um, IRB, the Institutional Review Board, processes and getting that approval done, and then the analysis component.